Hello, hello. This is Peter Nelson, um, president of Nelson Insurance Advisors, and I have Logan Hertz here um, with Hazeltine LLC. And, you know, we kind of really set the groundwork uh, for what we want to talk about today, kind of the be your own banker. And so, Logan, if you would, would you just please elaborate on, on the foundation that we've already set? Yeah, uh, I want to first say uh, what we're talking about is is referred to generally as the infinite banking concept. Okay, and what I've learned is that it's not that people don't understand the infinite banking concept or that you have to explain the infinite banking concept. Okay, you have to explain banking, right? That is really the issue. Most people really do not understand banking or how banking works. It's one of those things that they maybe think they know about just because they have a bank account, they interact with a bank, they can point to a physical location and tell you where the bank is. But once they put their money into that bank account, they have no idea what the bank is doing and how the bank is making money and why banking is such a profitable activity, right? So your checking account may be free, okay? but uh, the bank is still making money off of you, right? So we're, we're, we're talking about banking and that really is the gap in most people's knowledge. And the concept is distinct from the vehicle that we're using to do it. That's also important to understand because I'm gonna get into the vehicle that we're doing, that we're using to become our own bankers, but we have to understand that the concept comes first, okay? Strategy is what matters. The vehicle is less important, okay? So, what we're gonna do conceptually is when we spend the dollar today, that dollar is gone, right? We don't get that dollar back. And not only do we lose that dollar, we lose everything we could have earned on that dollar had we been able to save or invest it, okay? So what we're gonna do is by becoming our own bankers, what it's gonna allow us to do is instead of throwing money away when we spend it, we can merely recycle our money. So what happens is through the process of banking, through the process of becoming our own banker, when we spend money, it's not a permanent outflow of our money. That money doesn't permanently leave our personal economy. It only temporarily leaves our personal economy. And then it comes back with interest. Okay. So the way that uh, Jason Lowe will sometimes explain this, who's the number one infinite banking guy in Canada, is he'll say, imagine all the money you're going to spend from now until the day you retire, okay? Imagine what that number is. Now imagine I show up on the day you retire and I hand you a check for that full amount. That's the power of the infinite banking concept because what you did was you merely recycled through your own banking system. So when you spent it, you got the things you spent it on and then you got your money back, okay? So that should, I hopefully get everyone's attention as to why this is so important, why banking is such a profitable activity and why you want to be your own banker, right? And I'm not telling you to change anything about what you're doing. I'm just saying replace your Wells Fargo bank account with your own private bank account. You're going to be banking. It's just a question of who's going to be your banker, who's going to profit from that. You can either let Wells Fargo profit from it or you can profit from it. But one way or another, you will be banking. Okay. So how does it work? What are we doing here? Well, Let's imagine a scenario where you want to buy a $25,000 car, okay? You could pay cash, right? You hand over your $25,000 to get the car. You could go to the bank and take out a loan, right? You make a small down payment, you get the car, and then you make principal and interest payments to that lender until the note is paid off, okay? I'm telling you there's a third way, okay? Finance the purchase of that car with your own private bank. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your $25,000 you've earmarked for the car, and instead of handing it directly to the dealership, you're going to add an intermediate step. You're going to deposit it into your private bank account. Then your private bank is going to issue a loan to finance the purchase of that car. Okay, so you get the car, and then what happens? Well, you gave up your $25,000, right? So on day one, it's exactly the same as if you paid cash, okay? But on day two, things start to change because guess what? Your bank issued that loan, which means your bank gets paid back plus interest. So what happens is 
over the next several years, you get all of that purchase price back plus interest. Okay. That's how it works. And we're going to do this with all of our purchases, all of our cash flow, so we can keep recycling our money through our personal private banking system. And by the way, when rich people say keeping money in the family, this is exactly what they mean. This is exactly how they do it. When they need capital, they go to the family bank. They don't go to Wells Fargo. And all that money keeps getting recycled through their personal economy and it keeps earning. Because every time the bank gets paid back, it gets paid back with interest, right? Okay, so how do we do it? Well, the vehicle that we use for doing it is a very specially designed form of cash value life insurance, okay? Some people are familiar with cash value life insurance. Some people are not. It's probably better if you're not, because again, this concept is not a gimmick to sell whole life insurance. That's not what it is, okay? It is distinct from the vehicle we're using. And of course, the way we design the vehicle, the policy is very different from your typical policy in the way you're gonna be using it is very different from the typical policy. We're not looking at it as life insurance, although it is that, of course, it gives us that benefit, but it's a lot more than that. Okay. Let me stop you real quick on that, Logan, before you get into this, because I, <clears throat> I think this sure. is an important concept. Whereas the in a regular, what we think of, most Americans think of life insurance, they're trying to buy the highest death benefit, right? Mm -hmm. In this concept, we're actually trying to do the opposite. We're actually trying to buy the lowest death benefit, but then stuff the most cash that we can in without what we call as a modified endowment contract. So when we, we withdraw money out of it, um, it'll be income tax free. So I just wanted to make that quick uh, and you can continue, Logan. That's exactly right, Peter. If you were buying life insurance just for life insurance, you wouldn't want to pay the smallest possible premium and get the highest possible death benefit, get the most bang for your buck. Ironically, we're doing the opposite here. We want that death benefit to be as expensive as possible, okay? Because we want to get as much premium into the policy and shrink wrap it, as one guy says, with the minimum death benefit, okay? So we grow the most cash value, okay? So what makes whole life insurance unique from, say, term life insurance is that it grows cash value. And cash value is exactly what it sounds like. It is cash that you can use that's under your control. Okay. And Logan, real, real just let me start to jump in again, but I just want to make something. We're not saying you shouldn't own term life insurance. As a matter of fact, we are big proponents of buying um, 20 times your income. You should have um, in, in total overall life insurance. So that's where the term life works great to make sure that if you had some catastrophic event, you're going to cover it. I mean, I, I had a claim, a $50 a month term policy ended up paying out $1.2 million. Okay. We couldn't do that with this concept here. So we're, we're talking about actually created a, a blending portfolio of life insurance. So go ahead. Logan. That's correct. That's correct. I always recommend my clients be fully insured. Okay. Um, I am going to go now, <laughs> since you brought it up, this is important. Uh, your human life value uh, is typically a multiple of your income. Uh, depending on your age, it could be 30, 35 times your gross annual income. It could be based on your net worth. There are, mul net worth, there are multiple ways to calculate it. But when you start as a customer, when you sit down and ask yourself, how much life insurance do I need? That, that's the wrong question. This is not a need-based product. This is a want-based product, okay? And don't try and reinvent the wheel. The insurance companies employ armies of actuaries that imply actuarial science to tell you what your human life value is. So don't try and become an actuary and create your own actuarial model. The insurance company has done it for you. They're the experts in this, and they are deliberately underestimating your human life value. Okay, so if they tell you your total insurability is three million, you should absolutely not accept anything less than three million dollars worth of life insurance. Right. Think about if you've gotten into a car accident and your car is totaled. The insurance company is probably not going to overestimate what your car is worth when they pay you that claim. Right. They're the ones who are incentivized to underestimate it. Okay. It's the same thing here. So the way we do it is we look at it from an infinite banking perspective and we build an optimally designed banking system. And if that does not get the client fully insured, then we supplement that whole life policy 
with a convertible term policy to get them fully insured. So that's correct. That death benefit is very important. We're not poo-pooing that at all. Okay. And but, you know, you make an important point right there. I just want to stop you for a second. You said convertible term life insurance, because many a times you see people say the uh, the whole buy term and invest a difference crowd, and they're talking about the cheapest term out there. But then when you actually look at those cheap, super cheap term policies, the conversion privilege is either not the greatest, or you can only convert into some very mediocre um, permanent policies that is not going to allow you to do this. So this is where you want to deal with a financial professional that does this, has the experience, and, and knows which companies offer the best con convertible term life. You want a term policy that is convertible to a whole life policy and with a company that has a competitive whole life product, right? So that conversion privilege protects your insurability. Even if you don't want to do infinite banking, you have no interest in whole life whatsoever. A convertible term policy protects your insurability, okay? Let's imagine you're five years into a 10-year term policy and something happens to your health. Let's say you get a cancer diagnosis or a heart attack or a stroke or something like that. You'll The likely it is you'll probably survive. You'll probably recover, okay? But now that term is going to expire and you're going to have no options for life insurance because you're no longer insurable. Or maybe you're still insurable, but it's super expensive because now you have this health history, okay? If you have a convertible term policy, now you have the guaranteed right to convert some or all of it to whole life without underwriting. So you've protected your insurability. A convertible term policy is not that much more expensive and it gives you options. So I know we've kind of gotten distracted away from infinite banking, but I agree with you, Peter, these are important points to understand, okay? Which is why you wanna be working with a professional like myself or Peter who understand all of these, how it works together and so on, okay? And we're looking and, at it from a big picture perspective. Absolutely. And, you know, Logan, you make a good point there about the pricing. The pricing is actually pretty darn close. As a matter of fact, sometimes really good convertible term policies can actually be cheaper than these other term policies that I would never, I would never recommend. Um, so that's where you want someone who's not biased per se and can actually look at the rates and um, yeah. You might pay a little, and if you do pay a little bit more, that doesn't, that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you're getting more value, I mean, we don't go into a car dealership and we always say, give me that stripped down model. No, everybody has certain, certain things they want on their vehicles. It's kind of the same with, with this. I, I consider the, having it be a convertible term um, with certain features in it to be a non-negotiable when purchasing term life insurance so yeah yeah absolutely so getting back to the infinite banking concept what we're going to do in this example so we're trying to buy a $25,000 car okay we're going to take the $25,000 that we've earmarked for the purchase of the car we're going to pay it as a premium into our specially designed whole life insurance policy okay that premium payment immediately grows cash value that's available to us that cash value now earns interest and dividends tax-free, uninterrupted from now till the day we die. Now, here's where the magic comes in. If this were a standard checking account with Wells Fargo, we would just have to withdraw the money and buy the car. And now our money's gone. But we're not going to withdraw money. We are going to borrow against the cash value in the policy by taking out what's called a policy loan. So we take out a $25,000 policy loan and we go and buy the car. Now, from the car dealer's perspective, we just paid cash, okay? There's no loan from their side, okay? Now, why would we borrow against the policy instead of withdrawing the cash? Because you can do that, it's called a surrender. You can withdraw cash from your policy if you want. Why are we not doing that? Because now we're still earning interest and dividends on the full principal balance, okay? Think about what $25,000 can earn you in interest and dividends, even a modest amount, if you compound that out over 30 years. It's a huge chunk of change, huge, okay? Now, what about the policy loan? Some people would get scared when they hear the word loan. So a policy loan is not a debt. There are no repayment terms on that loan whatsoever. 
you are now your own banker. You issued that loan to yourself from your private bank and you decide if, how, and when you're gonna repay that loan, right? It's totally up to you. There are no repayment terms, okay? We won't get into too much of why, but basically it's because what you're borrowing against is cash that's guaranteed to grow. The collateral is guaranteed to be good, okay? And then there's a death benefit that pays out. So no matter what, that loan gets paid back one way or another, okay? So it's up to you now. And usually the way it works is when you're still in the accumulation phase of life, you're going to be strategically paying back those loans. And as you pay them back, you're just replenishing your own cash value. You're just recapitalizing your own bank. You can borrow it right back out again if you want. Meanwhile, that full pile of cash is now earning for you. Okay. So what happens now is we temporarily gave up $25,000, but over next, the next several years, thanks to compound interest, plus us making repayments if we want to, we're going to get all of that money back plus interest. Okay. The way I explain it to my clients is this. When you make a premium payment into your specially designed whole life insurance policy, you are permanently locking that money inside your personal economy where it can never escape because you're never going to withdraw it and it's going to be earning for you from now to the day you die. Okay. So if we're truly going to do infinite banking, we should not be worried about paying too low, too high of a premium. We should be worried about paying too low of a premium because either your money flows through your own private bank where you benefit from it, or it flows through somebody else's bank where somebody else benefits from it, right? There's no alternative. Every dollar that you don't put through your private banking system can now escape. Somebody else is profiting from it. And when you spend it, it's gone. You don't get it back. Okay. So we want to use our specially designed whole life insurance policy as our primary cash flow management tool. And we want to pay, this is a phrase you'll hear a lot in the infinite banking community. We want to pay the highest possible premium for the longest possible time frame. And once you understand what infinite banking is and how this works, you'll understand why you're only shortchanging yourself if you pay too low of a premium, right? The number one mental block we all have to get over when we start doing this is we have to stop seeing the premium payment as a liability. It is not a liability. Okay, you derive enormous benefits from those premium payments, and that money is not gone. It's not leaving your personal economy. It's all captured, protected, earning for you in a way that's not exposed to market risk, okay, and not exposed to taxation, and keeps earning for you from now till the day you die, regardless of what you do with that money. Spend it, save it, invest it, whatever you want to do with it, fine. But first, get it through your banking system, and then use the policy loan to finance whatever it is you were going to do anyway. Right. And I, and I think something we don't, that you've been talking about here, Logan, is that how much money is, is the average person in the long run actually giving up by not maintaining control of that money by never being able to make interest on it ever again? I mean, it, it is literally staggering. If you do the math on that, might be tens of thousands. It could be hundreds of thousands. It could actually be preventing the average American from becoming a millionaire. Absolutely. If you're 30 years old and you make a $10,000 purchase with cash, the cost to you is not $10,000. It's $10,000 plus whatever you could have earned on that $10,000. Let's say it's just 5%. Compound that from now to the day you die. If you're 30, you'll probably live another 50 years. What is 5% compounded over 50 years? It's an enormous number. It's way more than $10,000, okay? And now multiply that for every single purchase that you're making. Money is slipping through your fingers every day, every time you make a purchase. If we could recapture even a portion of that without changing what you're doing, why not do it? This, this is a no-brainer, right? That money is gonna be, that cash flow is gonna be managed somewhere. Right. And someone's going to earn on it. Why don't you earn on it? So, yeah, the that is a whole nother topic, the topic of opportunity cost, which conceptually, I think people understand it when you explain it to them, but they don't understand it on a practical level. Otherwise, they would live their lives totally differently. 
from the way that they do, which is why they spend money and they don't, don't even think about what the real cost to them of making that purchase is, okay? Um, when you consider the hidden cost of opportunity cost, which is, you know, especially if you're young, which is way more than the actual sticker price you're paying. So, I mean, in, in essence, it, to, I guess to dumb it down for, for the average person, we're just talking about creating a supercharged savings account that they can use to fund vehicle purchases, home purchases, you know, even certain living expenses, you need a dryer, you need a washer, you know, um, you know, supplement retirement income, you know, all these things that we're, we're this is a supercharged savings account, right? And investments too. You don't you don't use this only for purchases. You can use this for investments too. So if you're going to make an investment, take the money you've earmarked for that investment, pay it into your whole life policy, then take out a policy loan and go and purchase that investment. Okay. Now you're making money in the investment, and you're making money as the bank that financed that investment. Right. So you want as much of your cash flow as possible going through your own private banking system. So now you can use every dollar twice instead of once. That's what's called velocity of money. And that's what rich people do. They don't try and get a higher return on investment. What they do is they multiply their money using this concept of velocity of money so they can use every dollar multiple times. And real estate investors are experts at this. But yeah, uh, to boil it down, what you're doing, Peter, is when you spend money, you're still having to spend it. I'm not suggesting you can spend your way to prosperity or borrow your way to prosperity. No, 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 no. What I'm saying is if you're going to spend that money anyway, okay, what this allows you to do is to recover the opportunity cost. So if you're making a $25,000 purchase of a car, you still have to give up your $25,000, but now you're not giving up the ability to earn on that $25,000 because the $25,000 is still earning for you inside your policy, right? So that $25,000 did leave your personal economy for a moment, okay? But now, thanks to the earning, you're eventually going to get it all back. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that, Logan. That was uh, that was really good. And Peter, I think you're muted. But um, anyway. Oh, uh, can you hear me? No? Yeah, no, I can't hear you. But but yeah, that, that I think wraps it up for now. And that concept and I'm going to hopefully be putting together some uh, PowerPoint presentations to explain.